Cheers, Kev. Right, so I want to talk to you uh, about Entity Framework, and I'm going to go into a bit more of the advanced stuff. Well, I think it's advanced anyway. So I'm not going to um, show you many slides, so we'll come back to those. I want to show you the code. Um, so what I've done is I've created a, um, a .NET Core 2.2 API that uses Entity Framework. Um, so if you, would, if you were going to create a .NET Core um, API, and you want us to use Entity Framework, the first, thing, the first thing that you've got to do is configure Entity Framework. Um, so as you can see here, we've got the connection string, which looks like um, you know normal connection string, nothing um, spectacular there, until you get to the end. And then you've got these two properties um, called min pool size and application name. So min pool size, if you know that your application is going to get a lot of constant traffic, um, you can tell it to maintain um, a number of connection pools. Now, uh, these, these connection pools can be quite um, expensive to maintain, so only do this if you know that you're going to get constant, traf constant traffic, but it's better than constantly spinning them up. Um, and also, if you specify the application name, um, this is completely optional, but if you've got multiple things talking to your database, you can profile your DB and know which one is uh, uh, consuming all of the resources of that database. Another thing that we set is the pool size. So like we set the min pool size to five, this is actually the max pool size. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. So if we, if we have a look at our startup file, so there's nothing um, particularly complicated about that. It's just your standard startup file. You've got your configuration, your hosting environment, um, any services that you want to add. All I've done is add MVC and Swagger to this one. Um, kept it really simple. Um, and here, this is where we configure Entity Framework. Now, a common method to use instead of add DB context pool is add DB context. And that's fine. That will create you a DB context on each request. But if you, create, if you, if you use the add DB context pool, um, and you can optionally specify this pool size that we got from the config, um, it will basically reuse um, a, a collection of these DB context uh, pools. So it won't necessarily have to create them every time you can share them. And at the end of each request, um, the, the context will be reset. And anything that was stored inside it, um, it won't be valid on the next request. So then we're, we're telling Entity Framework that we want to use SQL Server. This is probably going to be the, the most common scenario. And we've got SQL Server connection string. Um, and the second thing that we, uh, that we should always do is enable retry on failure. So this will. Um, this will tell Entity Framework that if it gets transient errors, certain error codes back from SQL Server, things like timeouts, to just go ahead and retry that. That means that your application is more resilient, more stable. And then we can configure warnings. So if you've used Entity Framework, um, it's quite easy to, to get started, you know, to, to do your CRUD operations. But you can quite quickly get yourself into a position where um, the queries aren't being run on the, on the SQL Server. They're actually being run in memory. And Entity Framework, by default, will just log a warning. So unless you're on top of your warnings, you won't know about this. So if you tell Entity Framework that actually, um, if you evaluate anything in memory, which is going to be really, um, it's, going to, it's going to drain your application. It's, going to be, um, it's, it's not going to perform very well. Um, just tell it to throw an exception. So during development and testing, you can find those um, exceptions. You can fix up the code. You can make your application run uh, really quick. Uh, the next one, uh, sensitive data logging. So um, I did a talk uh, a few months back about logging. And if you enable this um, in certain scenarios, you can get information about the query that's being ran. So you can actually get the SQL. Uh, you can put that into whatever logging provider you want. It could be Raygun could be SEC, and we're going to have a look at another one today as well. Um, and you can tell it to only run that if it's a certain environment. So it's probably not advisable to run that on prod, but development's fine. You want to see all that information. And then finally, um, the, you want to set the tracking behavior on your DB context. So by default, um, a DB context will track anything um, that it sees. So if you add a new entity, if you, uh, if you get a list of them back, it will, it will basically track that in memory. Now, for an API, um, basically every request, you're going to get some data, you're going to send it back. You don't need to track that information. It's going to go from your controller and back out the door. So don't track it. Set the default tracking uh, behavior to no tracking. 
If you're returning or working with large lists um, of data, then this can be really uh, effective at increasing performance. Um, so the next thing that we're going to want to do, we're going to want to configure our entities. So for this example, um, we can see our entities um, down at the bottom. Um, so basically, we've got a student entity. That's all we've got at the minute. Um, so it's like a, a school scenario. So standard properties, it looks like a, a, a very standard POCO. But how do we tell Entity Framework, um, you know, what's the primary key? Do we want to map this property to this column name? So you can, you can use attributes, um, but some people are, the, are of the opinion that um, attributes pollute um, that class. Um, I, I, I like to keep them separate. So I prefer to create a separate configuration file for each entity. Um, these are called entity type configurations. So you simply implement this interface, um, you tell it what entity um, you're configuring, and then basically you can say, uh, like, like here, you can say this has got a key of student ID. You could also say that if you wanted to, um, what can we do? Uh, live coding. Um, so if we give it a different prob uh, property, um, so we can give it an index. We can say that, um, I don't know, we want to index on um, last name. If, if that's a, you know, a popular query that, we, that we're going to do, we can tell Entity Framework that we want to index on that. Now, the only exception to that, um, given the updates to all of the new gets, is, the, um, is specifying the table name, which that entity maps to. So you can see that I've got an attribute there. So that's telling me that student entity maps to a table called student. Now you used to be able to do that using the fluent syntax, but I couldn't find a way um, to do that after upgrading all of the NuGet packages. Um, it seems to be something that they've, they've now taken out. So that's the one exception there. But we've got all of these entities, we've got all of these entity type configurations, but your DB context still won't know um, what to do with them. It won't know anything about them. So in your DB context, if you override on model creating um, in, uh, in the latest version of uh, Entity Framework Core, they've given you this nice method, ap apply configuration from assembly. You just give it assembly, and it finds all of those entity type configurations. So you add that, well, those two lines of code, and then all you have to do is keep creating your entity type configurations, and your DB context um, will know about them. So, Let's say you've got an application, it's doing some read operations, it's doing some write operations, and your boss says, you know, I want an audit log of everything. And you're thinking, okay, um, rather than baking that into every part of your business layer, you want a, a nice one-size-fits-all um, audit log. So quite a common approach um, is to just create an audit table. Um, so here we've got an audit entity uh, class, which maps to an audit table. And we've got a few columns. We've got a primary key. Um, we've got a column for key values, um, so that could be a, a single primary key or it could be a composite key, depending on the table. You've got the new values, so for each entity that you change, it will, um, it will store the new values and it will store the old values, uh, values. and it will also store the table name. Um, so in this case, we've only got students, so everything will be relating to the student table. A transaction ID, so if you do multiple uh, writes in the same batch, um, they'll all have the same transaction ID and when it was created. Now that has, has its own entity type configuration. It's pretty much the, uh, the same as the other one. We tell it the primary key. We give it some indexes because we're going to want to search um, you know, through this audit log. We're going to want to find information. And then we have to do quite a bit to our DB context in order for that, that audit log to, uh, to make sense. And, you know, for, for us to get the audit information into our database. So you have to override a few methods. So the first one is on before save changes. Now, that basically um, uses the built-in change tracker that's built into Entity Framework, um, and it builds up a, a state of all your entities, so it gets the old values and the new values. Now, it does some, does some logic, uh, you know, getting all, getting all that information, and then at the bottom, basically loops through all of the um, entities that we need to audit and it says find me all the ones that haven't got any temporary properties 
And by that, I mean any, any values that would be generated by SQL Server. So if you've got uh, integer primary keys and they're all auto-incremented on the server, um, then it can't audit that information until the, uh, the commit has taken place. And in, in that case, it does it after we've saved the entities that we're trying to audit. So if we have a look at the, the save changes um, method, which we've also had to override. So this is where the auditing takes place. So we call on before save changes to get all of our uh, audit information. Uh, we call save changes on the base. And then if we've got anything that we need to set, any audit entries that we need to save after that fact, we can do so. So if we have a look at, uh, this, is, this is the database. So if I have a look at the, um, the audit log table, just do, a, just do a cursory scan on that. We can see that um, we've got 100 rows because I've got CEDA, which inserted 100 students. They've each got a different primary key. Um, the key values column is basically the, the primary key of the student that was inserted. The new values column is populated, and we'll have a look at that in a second. It hasn't got an old values uh, entry because we've inserted something, so it couldn't have had an old values. If we edited that entity, then it would have an old values as well, so you'd be able to see the delta between a, 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 an update. Table name student, and they're all in the same transaction ID because they did it in the same batch. Now, because um, you know we've got JSON here, you might be thinking, well, that's not you know that's not that easy to search, but it is. Um, with the new changes to to SQL Server, we can actually um, query uh, any of these three columns. So the, the key values, the new values, and the old values um, using JSON value. So I know that there's a, there's a chap called Jail, uh, Gail in here. Um, and then we can get the specific row that we're interested in. Uh, another thing to add um, regarding this is all of the entities in this example inherit from this I entity, and they have uh, a created at and an updated at um, column. So if we have a look again at student entity, we can see that it implements that interface and it has those two properties, nothing crazy there. But what does it do with those properties? So if you have a look at the, the, the uh, DB context again, uh, again, we've overridden the, the save changes so we can uh, do some funky logic there. So we'll use the change tracker again and we'll find all of the entities that implement that interface. Um, and if they've been added, so if the entity state is added, we can set the created at and the updated at. If they've been modified, we can just set the updated at. And what this does, uh, if we have a look at the student table, so that just creates us uh, two columns uh, on each table, and we don't need to worry about updating these values. Now, you could argue that you could join back to the audit uh, log to get that information, which you could, uh, by all means. Uh, you could get the most recent audit to know when that entity was updated, but it's just nicer to have that there. Um, we find that we use these quite a bit. So we've got this API. Uh, we know that we've got Swagger. So let's have a look at our Swagger. So uh, this has got a, an endpoint for listing students. So let's just call that. So that's returned as a list of students. But what about if you've got a scenario where one of your endpoints is not, not performing as well as you'd like it to? Um, how, do you, how do you find out what's going on? How do you know the SQL, the entity framework, is producing for you? Because you know, you know the, uh, the link query, but you don't know the SQL. Now, there's a few ways you could do that. You could use uh, a, a SQL Server Profiler. You could use Entity Framework Profiler, but you have to pay for that. Or you could use this tool called uh, Stackify Prefix. Um, it's completely free. It installs locally on your machine. Um, it also acts uh, like a log uh, sync, a bit like SEC or Raygun. Um, so you get all your debug logs, um, but you also get um, your SQL come out there if you tell it to. So we use this, um, we use this uh, a lot uh, at Razor when we're developing. So here you can see, um, can, can you guys see that at the back? Okay, or do you want me to zoom in? Yeah, is that right? Um, not really? Yeah. Let me know when. Oh, that's a bit big. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. So we can see that that th th this request um, for the students list endpoint came in at 1851. It's just it's the one that we just made. So we can click on that. We can see the response time was 29 milliseconds. And we can see various logs throughout that request. 
but the one that I'm most interested in is the sequel. Um, and we can literally get that raw SQL and it's very readable, which is something that I like. Um, if you view, sometimes if you use SQL Server Profiler, it can be a little bit clunky and you get a lot of noise. This just seems very clean. And you know, the fact that it relates it to all my other logs that are coming from my app is quite nice. So you could use that. You could, uh, one thing that I use it for is to know how many um, SQL queries are being executed on that endpoint. Because you might write, write one link statement, but actually Entity Framework um, behind the scenes maps that to you know, two or three SQL statements. So you might try and optimize that. So if we look at this one, um, we're returning quite, quite a bit more information than we need. Um, we're, re we're returning the um, updated at and the created at columns. But we don't need those. They're sort of like internal columns that we should never expose. And if we look at this, um, you know, we're, we're not sending them back to the client. So we, we actually, um, we're sending back more than we need from the SQL Server. So what we can do is, uh, if we look at our endpoint, uh, bad, 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 bad. so basically, uh, wait, not that one, uh, list, 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 right. So we're just doing a where clause um, on students, but we're not filtering, uh, we're, not, we're not projecting, we're not saying we only want these certain columns. So what we can do is uh, we can, if we get this bit of code, so we can paste that in there. Now, the main difference is that we're actually projecting the result using a select statement. So we're telling Entity Framework that we're only interested in student ID, first name, last name, and date of birth. Basically, don't do a select star. So if we save that, and then we go back to our Swagger and um, reload that uh, endpoint. So we get the same result back. If we go back into prefix, uh, we can see another request has come in. And we can see that we're no longer uh, returning created at and updated at. Now that's a marginal gain. Um, but you know, if you, th they're well worth putting in. All of those little marginal gains will add up. So to, uh, to wrap up, uh, well, as, as, as an addition to what I've just said, don't abstract an abstraction. So Entity Framework is a, gr a good enough abstraction to your data layer. Um, quite often I see um, our repository of T um, put in there, and it, it's an absolute waste of time, in my opinion. Um, add, add business logic around your Entity Framework, uh, uh, around your DB context, but just masking what, uh, what your DB context can do um, might actually create more problems than you're trying to solve. Um, if you're worried about testability, your DB, te uh, DB context can be mocked. So don't use our repository as an excuse for not being able to test. And one other thing, uh, that, well, one ar other argument that I hear about uh, the, the, the case for using a repository pattern is uh, reusable code. But you can create um, extension methods. So um, instead of doing dot where and having a, 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 a lambda expression in there, you can create an extension of, of where active. So if that logic was to ever change, it changes throughout your application. So you can be smart like that. Um, and try not to pass entities beyond your controller. Um, you know, if you're doing an API, you should have a response object, map your entities to that, and then you're not going to bleed out um, too much information. Um, I tend not to use lazy loading. Um, I think it's, it's a bad thing. Uh, I would disable it by default. Um, you should know what you need to get upfront when you need to get it. I hear this a lot. Entity framework is slow. Um, yeah, it can be slow. Um, Jamie's uh, grinning. So some people just, you know, th th they, they don't like entity framework, they, which is fine. Um, but in my opinion, the development time of using entity framework is lower than if you were to write raw SQL. But there'll, there'll become a point, there always will, where uh, you need to replace certain queries with raw SQL or something like Dapper. Um, but my advice is just to do that on an ad hoc basis. Um, start using Entity Framework, and then when you get something that can't be optimized with Entity Framework, um, then go the other way. Um, so just in case you didn't know, I work for Razor. Um, we're a technology agency just based literally two minutes that way. Um, we're hiring developers, testers, designers. If you're interested, come give me a shout.
Okay, thank you.